Tara and Lisa and the rest of the staff here at Huguenot Street. And all of you for coming. Um, I ask that you hold questions until the end. Um, if there's something you really have a question about, you know, I would suggest writing it down if, that, if you have that ability. We've got a lot to cover, uh, so I will try and keep things moving along. So when you consider Dutch or Netherlandish architecture, you have to understand what is Netherlandish. In the 17th century, the Netherlands is the seven provinces, but those are the northern Netherlands. The southern Netherlands, which were still controlled by the Spanish, are what we would consider Flanders, the, the Dutch-speaking portion of Belgium. So today there are 12 provinces of the Netherlands, in 1609, seven. Uh, what is missing in this map, uh, so Limburg is now a Dutch province, North Brabant is a Dutch province, uh, Flevoland is not on this map, uh, Holland is now split into two, um, and over, no, there's Gelderland, Gelderland. So this is the area where the people from the Netherlands ostensibly are coming. But remember, it's the height of the Dutch Republic. Things are the best that they've ever been in the Netherlands. So getting settlers, colonists, to come here is a difficult task. Uh, so the first batch of colonists the New Netherlands Company sends over, the West India Company sends over in 1624, is actually Walloons. So the fact that Huguenot Street here in New Paltz was, was settled by uh, Protestant refugees from France, who had then gone to Germany and then through the Netherlands, is pretty much par for the course. So you sort of see how it develops over through the 17th century. Um, now, architecturally, you'll see there's a difference. Northern, the true, the true provinces of the Netherlands tend to use brick. Timber frame, Flanders, you'll see there's a lot of stone. Also, uh, Limburg, or Maastricht is. The Catholic provinces of the Netherlands, because they are on harder soil, tend to use stone. The more low country, it's brick and timber frame. Which becomes an interesting fact when you look at the architecture being built in the Netherlands in the Hudson Valley. Because we have this giant swath where we're all living now, uh, the Mid-Hudson Valley, where stone is the primary building material from the early 18th century through the end of the, the 18th, early 19th century, when the, the Dutch style start to fall out of favor. Um, so you look at the houses along Huguenot Street, and we like to say they're Dutch stone houses, Traditionally, the Dutch didn't build in stone. Um, actually, the word steam in Dutch is what they used to refer to bricks as, when it's interchangeable with stone. So, New Netherlands. This is the Vischer map, the Janssen Vischer map. Um, unlike English maps of the time, where all of these towns are listed the Dutch are focusing on Native American villages. If you notice in the, in the marginalia, it's animals. This is a trading map. This shows you the rivers. This shows you where the Native American villages are. This shows you, you know, the different Native American tribes. This is designed for an economic engine. This is not colonialism. Colonialism happens in connection, in conjunction with this, but the driving force into New Netherland is not, is not the same thing as it is in New England or in Virginia. If you look at uh, English maps of New England at the time, specifically 1630, 1640, they're listing towns that don't exist and will never exist. Um, they're advertisements. Uh, Adrian van der Donk famously goes home and he writes the description of New Netherland, which is pretty much a uh, come to New Netherland, it's awesome book. 
Uh, he, of course, goes home. They don't really get his way. He ends up being killed in one of the uh, Native American conflicts. Um, but to this day, we have a town named after his estate, Yonkers. So. But to look at Dutch architecture in North America, it really is three watersheds. Now, you'll see here, Bennington's on this map. If you go to Bennington, Vermont today, you will find Dutch houses. Um, you, th you have to think, think like a Dutch person. It's water. It's all about water. So the Dutch move up the rivers. Um, I can tell you that the furthest east Dutch house that I found still standing in Massachusetts is in Beckett. Whether or not that comes out of the Hudson watershed or the Connecticut watershed, I'm not certain. Um, there are the other two. So you had the North River, the Hudson. You had uh, the South River and the Fresh River, which is Connecticut. Now back to the Fisher map to close it all in. Now, I'm a timber frame, primarily. I mean, my degree is in preservation with a specialty in architectural history. But mainly Monday through Friday, I'm, uh, I'm cutting frames. So I tend to look at Dutch architecture from the viewpoint of a timber frame. And when you look at this frame, this is the key to all Dutch architecture. It's what uh, some architectural historians call the age vent system. Um, the Dutch would refer to this uh, as a through beam, which is a tussen bulk. Uh, it's got this lovely knee ball. The Dutch word for that is for deep beam, uh, which really has sort of become interchangeable for knee ball, but it's also any store, any, any floor above the first floor. Um, so much as the English say ground floor, first floor, second floor, the Dutch will say ground floor, first for deeping, second for deeping, and so forth. So looking for this frame and that knee wall in the Hudson Valley, or in New Jersey, Western Massachusetts, Western Connecticut, you'll be able to find Dutch houses and their descendants. Because Dutch carpentry clearly doesn't end in 1664 when New Netherland Falls. Um, we know, in fact, that the Albany Law Courts were still having their proceedings in Dutch until the 1690s. Um, we know that Martin Van Buren's wife, who was born in 1783, didn't learn English until she was 16 years old. And little known factoid, um, I'll go back. This section is Rensselaerwijk which is the patroonship of Killian von Rensselaer, established in 1630. Not only does it survive the English takeover in 1664, in 1783, when the English retire from the continent, or from the lower section of the continent, and the United States is created, the government of the United States recognizes the medieval fuel holding of the Rensselaer family, and the patroonship of, of, of the Rensselaer family exists as a geopolitical entity until 1859, hmm. when the last patroon gives away his rights. But, oddly enough, there are still pieces of former Rensselaer bike where if you sell your property, the Rensselaer family has to sign off on it. 300 years later, actually almost 400 years later, the reach of Killian Van Rensselaer is still felt in the Hudson Valley. Strangely enough, people don't know these things, but it's, it's, it's got a very long-standing <coughs> sense. So you look at this, the Dutch house here. It's exceedingly different from the English house. This is a standard cape, um, you know, big time joints, uh, fairly low. The trick to looking for, for pure New England capes is uh, are the windows at the plate line? So this is the this is the plate of any building. If the windows are right up against the, the roof line, that's a traditionally framed, probably 17th, 18th century, early 19th century English cave, or actually any any English house where those windows are right up there, even on two story. Um, so you go to the House of Seven Gables, they're right up there because they're using that plate as the top of the window. So. 
There was a book that came out, oh, 1983, The Field Guide to American Houses by Virginia Lee McAllister. They're the first people to try and classify Dutch houses. And they break it into three sections, uh, which I find uh, useful. So that's sort of broken these sections. They've got urban, they've got rural, and they break rural into the, the eaves. Um, are they flared eaves or are they unflared eaves? So I'm going to try and, that's how I've broken this one up. And then there's other portions we'll go through. So this is the classic Dutch city. This is Delft. Um, the, the, the state house here, the Stahus, survived the Delft thunderclap when, uh, when the armory exploded and wiped out 60% of the, of the standing city of Delft in the 1650s. Um, much of these buildings around the marketplace were from that period. This is what Albany would have looked like. Perhaps not to this grand scale. And if you'll notice, I mean, they're using stone on the state house. Uh, right across from the market, right across from the state house is the new church, which was completed in 1380. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to Delft, I highly recommend it. So this is the, the Prince's Canal, the Prince and the Hot in, uh, in Delft as well. This is what Canal Street would have looked like in, in New Amsterdam. Hmm. Um, when you think about the fact that 400 years ago, nearly 400 years ago, you had these sort of bustling metropolises, which really hit their peak in the 1650s, and then the English take over, and the Dutch linger with their house styles, but New York City, which, is, which has the most Dutch architecture, eats itself every 20 years. Um, there's three structures on the island of Manhattan from the 18th century, um, and one of those is a park. Um, and Francis Tavern is, in fact, a restoration. It's not original. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to find you know, 18th century houses, really, you need to go to Brooklyn, Staten Island. Now, we don't have a lot of this style, but this is, uh, these are from Zandam. These are actually in the museum in Arnhem, which if you get a chance to go over to the Open Lift Museum in Arnhem, is kind of like Sturbridge, only it spans about a thousand years and every province of the Netherlands. Um, Zandam is most famously known for its uh, plethora of mills. It's also out on the coast. Um, it's on made land. Uh, the Dutch have this, this great saying, uh, God, God created the earth, but the Dutch made Holland. <laughs> um, much of Holland is, much of, and when I say Holland, I'm really talking North Holland, South Holland. Um, because the eastern provinces of uh, Overijssel, Drenthe, Gelderland, Groningen, um, those are on bedrock. Um, but once you start to get out to the coastal areas, uh, it's made land with polder, polder, polder dikes. Um, it's sort of interesting over there being on a train and having <coughs> barges go over your head. Um, and you're 15 feet below sea level. This was thought to be the oldest house in Amsterdam. Um, it's in the Heinhof, which is a cloistered area um, within the city. It survived the 17th century fires. Um, this is no longer known to be the oldest house in, in Amsterdam. They found an older one. There was a nightclub that had a fire a couple of years ago, and the fire department came in to check the damage, and they found some burned beams. And they said, well, these were burned a long time ago. And then they did the dendro, and they realized the building was in 1470. Um, Which house? Left or here? No. So this is the this is the Houghton House, the wooden house, oh. 1528. Um, I'm not entirely certain where the nightclub is. It's not in this neighborhood. I suspect it's it's over in the old portion of the city, um, near the near the dance dot square. But uh, as a as a side note, the Bechainhof to this day is a community for. Um, for women in, dis women in distress, as it were. Um, it's run by, by an order of nuns. There's a 10-year waiting list to get in, because once you're in the house, everything's covered. 
your housing is free, you're given a food stipend. Um, it's sort of Amsterdam's best halfway house, except it's, a, it's an entire square, and you get, you know, how, these are all broken into apartments. And in the 17th century, they were also using this area for political refugees. So the church that is right across from this house in Bechainhof is where um, the pilgrims had their religious services before they sailed for Plymouth. Um, I've thrown this in because this is, this is as high style as it gets. Um, and it's early 16th century stone. I've never seen record of anything like this being built by the Dutch in the New World. Not this high style. This is, it's sort of interesting because I suspect a lot of this was, brought, bought, was built by Spanish money because it's 100 years before the provinces break free. What we have in the United States for urban, oh, no, yeah. sorry, forgot we were skipping through Lindbergh. Um, this is the German section. This is Lindbergh, which uh, has its own dialect, Limburger, has amazing cheese, um, <laughs> and doesn't really have step gables. Um, mm -hmm. And and you'll notice there's a bunch of stones sneaking in, a little coin here and there. Um, Maastricht, because of where it is, it's been the scene of a couple invasions. Um, if you're walking around Maastricht and you turn the wrong direction, you can wander into Belgium <laughs> or Germany. Uh, and the dialect there is something of a cross between Dutch and German. Um, but they do have some step gabling, but it tends to be on the sides of the building. Uh, and here you can see all these giant wall anchors. Now, the Dutch used those to tie timber framing into the brick skin. So if you're driving around and you see uh, the Du Bois Fort or uh, some of the houses up in Kingston, where their big wall anchors mirror anchor at the end. Uh, they tended to do them decoratively as dates, but that is, a, that is tying the skin of the building to the timber frame within. Now this is Ghent. Ghent, as they say. This is Flanders. This is as Catholic Netherlands as you can get. Um, most of Flanders, I mean, Ghent was a big city, lots of money. This is its high style, but if you also notice, there's this beautiful carving, but the stone's still very rustic. And that's the way it was done. But you know, they still, they're incorporating some brick. Um, but you've got some layer, you know, that's sort of a 19th century style layer. This is classical 18th century. Um, you start to get these Georgian scroll works. What happens, interestingly enough, is um, in the late 17th century, the Glorious Revolution happens in England. And William of Orange and his, and his soon-to-be wife Mary come over to England, and the King of the Netherlands is suddenly the King of England. Um, and everybody starts doing these scrolled gables. You go, to, you go to England, any buildings that were built in the first part of the 18th century, they tend to have Dutch accents. And it is that moment where um, it starts to get very confused as to where the, where the Dutch influence is. Because the English, for about 50 years, uh, make everything sort of a bit Netherlandish. Now, you've been to Schenectady. This is in the stockade. For years, this was believed to be the only Netherlandish urban structure still in a, in a truly urban setting. I mean, we've got, we've got uh, buildings in Kingston, but they're sort of transitional. This, is, this has got the stepped gables. This has got the wall anchors. Um, this is... And then, about 15 years ago, this was discovered. 1728. 
It's at 48 Hudson Avenue in Albany. It's right outside of what was the stockade. And until the Dutch government, Dutch culture, paid for this scrim to be put on it, you'd have no idea. It's got a 1930s storefront. It's had a 1930s storefront since the 1930s. And before that, uh, so, so in 1728, it's built, looks like this. Uh, there's a side aisle, 1790, they enclose the side aisle, widen the roof. <laughs> then 1830, they put a three-story factory on the back side of it, which then expanded in the 1870s. And the 1930s, it turns into an appliance store. Um, the great thing is, is every time someone buys this, it's like a place in the mall. <laughs> they take it back to the, to the bones. Um, now, some of it's been cut out, but some of the really critical parts, like this molded end beam, what we call a pow ball, are still there. There are three of those in existence in the United States. Um, the Van Ostrom House, the Peter Winnie House, which is in Bethlehem, New York, and the Andrew Winnie House, which if you've been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, one of the rooms, well, the remainder of the Andrew Winnie House is now at the Met. And they've taken that molded end beam and put it against the cinder block wall so you'll never see it again. Um, so, uh, if you get the chance, this is currently owned by Historic Albany Foundation, um, if you get a chance to go see this, it's sort of a fascinating remnant of what Albany used to look like. We have records, there were, there were over a hundred, if not more, houses that look exactly like this, inside and outside the stockade, in, in, in what was originally Fort Orange, and then became Beaver-like, and then Albany. Now I consider this to be, a, to be an urban form, because it's gable-ended, the original section is just this one wing, um, it originally had the Kutz design, the, the cross form windows. Uh, and if I remember correctly from my years working here, when this was built, uh, there were 20 people living in, in this sort of one room with an upper chamber. Um, and if you've been in Gravierelton, you know that sort of tight quarters. Um, so I believe that when, when Gravierelton was built, the Du Bois Fort looked similar, and the, 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 Jean, the original Gene Hasbrook house was a 20 by 20 uh, house, what is now probably the southwest corner. Uh, Dendro has shown that there's one beam in there that comes from 1698, which would make sense, and then it's expanded in 1721 into the transitional Germanic form we see today. So, rural unflared, that's sort of a it's an odd uh, title, but I guess it makes it a little bit more handleable. This is a classic farmhouse, which is what we have here. Um, you can see here in the brickwork, there's a, what are sometimes referred to as mouth, mouse teeth, or flattigen, tumbling. Um, you'll see that on various houses throughout the Hudson Valley, if they're brink. Um, one of the forms that the Dutch do not carry over, it doesn't survive the Dutch period, <coughs> are these, um, these long houses, long houses, where the barn and the house are connected. We know there are contracts <coughs> for long houses, and I will show you one. Um, that matches the description of the couple that we have, um, but they don't survive probably because they're what uh, architectural historians refer to as post and tear. So the posts are in the ground. Uh, so there, there's the other Powell. This is the Peter Winnie House, which is in the process of restoration. Um, it is within five years of the Van Ostrand House. Um, this is one of the few houses we have standing in the Hudson Valley that was built while New Netherland was still owned by the Dutch. Um, and if anyone's been to Peter Brown's house, there's this, it's sort of this, this stone 
clumpy thing. Um, and when you think about it, how much time it takes to gather that much stone. I mean, we know that New Paltz was, the patent was signed in 1678. The first houses don't really go up until the late 1690s. Um, it takes a long time to gather that much stone and create lime. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, the Dutch, well, the Huguenots were living in pit houses and post in terror houses. Joe Diamond has found, uh, has found them here on the street. So you have to wonder, if Peter Bronck builds this in 1663, what's he living in before this? And this is, this is absolutely the frontier in 1663. This is uh, right below what they call the Kalkberg, Chalk Mountain. Um, and later, about 70 years later, Leander Bronck builds the, the transitional uh, stepped gabled house that's connected to the Peter Bonk house. Another unflared farmhouse, um, it's about Antwerp Navy House. This is on the western edge of New Netherland. This is out in a, in a fur trading area west of Schenectady. Um, we know that the, the local Mohawk we're using this 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 house as a trading post. Hmm. Strangely enough, um, this is built in two phases, much like the Abraham Hasbrook or the Vera Elting house. Uh, the finishes are different in both rooms. And as an oddity, the window in the in the in the nearer chamber actually is uh, is closer to a style you'd find in uh, in Montreal. Um, so there is some supposition that uh, through the Native American trade and this being used as a trading post, that the carpenters who finished off this house potentially were, were um, came down to the Quebecois area. Uh, these are horrible pictures of the Lake of Allen House, but again, this is built in two phases, with this being the first phase, and then it gets expanded as the family grows. Um, and and a lot of the a lot of the houses in the Hudson Valley follow this pattern, where you'll have uh, this room, which is the great room or the quick common, and then up here you'll you'll step up into the upper chamber, um, or the uh, or the op common, and below that will be a kitchen. Generally, utilized by enslaved Africans, or. Um, Sharecroppers, that sort of thing, indentured servants. Um, the Dutch, who ostensibly were slightly easier on enslaved Africans than the English, still made a great deal of money transporting them. Um, enslaved Africans in New Netherland could buy their freedom, but still, uh, you have to look at these houses within the context of much of your work can be done by enslaved African labor. So putting people in a basement with very little light, cooking. Um, for, we look at it with modern sensibilities and it doesn't make sense, but in 17th and 18th century, New Netherlands and then New York, it, it, it plays out. So more these are probably the southernmost example of Dutch brick urban. Uh, this is a, it's another Van Heusen house. Uh, it's got the, the tumbling in the end. It's got these lovely little marble holes. And if you go actually see it, you can't see it's not a great picture. But in the brick is a tulipier vase. Um, so, and this one uh, resides in a, in a trailer park <laughs> in Hudson. Uh, there's some restoration work going on there right now. Uh, but, uh, so this is 1730s, this is 1720s, but the original wing, the stone wing on the back side is 1670s. So it appears much like Peter Bronk that the early houses were built out of stone, potentially because you were in um, not the friendliest territory. There are a series of conflicts in the 18th and 17th and 18th century 
between the Native Americans and the Dutch colonists. Um, sometimes because the Dutch governors side with the wrong people, but they break, <coughs> they break the rules and they side with somebody. Uh, and sometimes uh, because mistakes are made, cultural, uh, cultural confusions happen and, uh, and suddenly it's all at war. Now, everyone likes to talk about those swept eaves. Everyone likes to talk about the Dutch swept eave. I have been to 10 of the 12 provinces in the Netherlands. I have never seen a swept eave <laughs> in the Netherlands. Wow. Um, I have seen these in Normandy. I have seen these in what uh, in the portion of Belgium called Wallonia. Um, I have seen these in Flanders. Hmm. Some actually some architectural historians refer to these as the Flemish kick. Um, this is not a northern Netherlands tradition, hmm. and yet it is used heavily in the southern portions. The, the first ones you can find are sort of in the Tapan region. And South Long Island is, is you know, if you've got a, a wooden frame Dutch house on Long Island, chances are it's got one of these kicks on it. Um, New Jersey, sort of lousy with them. Um, now, these are more traditionally timber frame buildings. These are not brick buildings. These are not stone buildings. These are timber frame buildings. And they tend to use these as porches, overhangs. Um, I'm not entirely certain if it's climatic, why they're doing this, but I can also say that the original settlers of New Amsterdam were Walloons. The Dutch couldn't actually get Dutch to come to New Netherlands, so they sent Walloons, and Palatines, and Huguenots. Uh, anyone that can basically con into signing up. Um, they try and lay out exorbitant bonuses for soldiers who were here with the West India Company to stay on. Something like 90% of them went back to the Netherlands. Um, everyone paints it as a sort of land of milk and honey, but in, in 1650, you're still eking out, you're still sort of carving out, and oh hey, the natives occasionally kill you. Um, yeah, so this is the Vykoff House in Brooklyn. Again, there's that Flemish kick. Um, but these are traditionally Dutch framed buildings. These have the tussin balks in them. They've just got this, this overhang. Um, if you want to see a more traditional overhang, I mean, you should go back a little bit. Uh, oh, I, no, no. It's the, it's the, the Revere Elton House. That wood block there, that overhang, that is a traditional Dutch overhang. This, this Flemish kick is... So when you're considering, you know, people like to say Dutch architecture, I say, I say Netherlandish, because Flanders is, net, is part of is southern Netherlands. So, you know, this is not Dutch. It's Netherlandish. You can argue, you can make the case this is from Flanders. Which, I mean, it's Catholic, Southern Netherlands, but it's still the Netherlands, the Low Countries, and it's a lot of them. I mean, linguistically the same, slightly different. I mean, Flemish, Dutch, Limburg—they're all cousins. You can understand each other if it's just varying degrees of um, sort of what you do with your genes. Now, there's a form that arises here in the United States that you you don't generally have in urban areas in the Netherlands. What I call transitional. And, and one of the more clear-cut cases of this is just up the street. It starts as a one-room building, but the gable is no longer to the street. It is eaves-ended. This is a complete departure from 500 years of Dutch building tradition in urban areas. Because if you're making land, you're dividing lots into narrow spaces 
And much like medieval English cities or French cities, the lots are long and narrow, and you want, you know, it's, it's all sort of back, as many fronted as possible. And they get here and they realize you don't need to maintain that mode, especially in these semi urban areas, Kingston, which, uh, so built like uh, New Paul's, Hurley where in the 1670s, 1680s, they start to realize that you can, you can change the orientation of the buildings. And by the 1720s, 1730s, it's in full swing. These transitional houses, the, the Washington headquarters down in Newburgh, will become the norm. The gable-ended houses are gone. This is the new style if you want pure Dutch. And again, so there's your first room. There's the first edition. So this is what we would call the, the great chamber, the crypt common. And then this is the upper chamber, the op common, with the kitchen down below. So much of your Dutch, much of the Dutch houses maintain this profile. And a lot of times, the roof line is continuous. There's not even stepping. As a matter of fact, I think you can barely see the stepped roof here on the third wing of the Abe. So this is that style I was talking about, the long house, which we know comes over in the Dutch period, but doesn't survive. So this is a very early uh, Friesland Friese Langhaus. This is 15th century in the, uh, the Open Air Museum in Arnhem. It is a combination house and barn. That's the back side of it. There's no chimney to speak of. It's got a smoke hood. Um, this is medieval. This is Netherlandish medieval. And then it develops into these. Masonry, steeply pitched roofs, H bench with these barns. You typically had the farmhouse up here. This was a mixed use section. Uh, dairy, uh, buttery pantry, sometimes sleeping quarters. And then back here is where your, your animals are kept. Uh, this one? The barn house itself is tiny. That's 20 by 20. The barn is huge. Uh, also, that thatching pattern is original. <coughs> the, the, the quality of thatching in the Netherlands with the, pan, with the combination of pan tile and thatch is pretty impressive. Pan tiles, originally, mm -hmm. were the thing. It is postulated that the Jean Hasbrook house originally was thatched in 1720. Potentially, Bivier Elting had pan tiles. Um, this style of roof doesn't do very well in the New World. Thatch really doesn't do well in the New World. Um, which is funny when you consider the climate of the Netherlands, it's fairly damp. Uh, but for whatever reason, they do not get the blizzards and the nor'easters like we do. Uh, and I will tell you that the settlers in Plymouth found out very early on that Watland Dog uh, buildings with thatch roofs don't last. Uh, but it's also a matter of material. In the Netherlands, trees are scarce. Clay is everywhere. The timbers are being brought in from Scandinavia through the Hanseatic League. You're thatching with reed. Netherlands is a swamp. Reed is plentiful. Clay to make tiles is plentiful. Clay to make bricks is plentiful. The, the only thing you really need are timbers to make the interior framing. You come to the New World, there's trees everywhere. Um, they, again, this is you know, the farmhouse up front, but this one's more, it's actually more of a barn. The farmhouse section is tiny. This, it's, it's rigid from Trenta, which is uh, one of the easternmost provinces, northeastern, it's near the German border. This is what we have contracts for. 
we know that they were building houses like this hmm. in the lower portions of the Hudson Valley and New Jersey and Western Long Island in the 17th century, 1630s, 1640s. Obviously, none of these houses survive. Um, they were thatched, generally wall and daub. We're going to discuss why that doesn't survive in the United States. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's a massive form, but with so much material. And once New Amsterdam falls to the English, many of the Dutch living in the areas where these were built flee to the peripheries. Many of them move up here to, to the Mid-Hudson Valley, and then even further up into what is Rensselaerwijk. Um, so we know that Martin Van Buren's wife in the late 18th century, you know, she didn't learn to speak English until 1799. Um, the, the records show that uh, during the American War for Independence, in negotiations between the, the colonial army and the nation of the Mohawk, they brought a Dutch interpreter because the Mohawk didn't speak English. They spoke Dutch because that's who they were still trading with. Between Schenectady and what is now modern Rensselaer down into what is now Hudson, that was all still Dutch territory, which is why you know you got buildings like the Van Allen House, which was built in 1735. 70 years after the fall of New Netherland are being built in a, in a fashion that's not even fashionable in Holland anymore at that point. Um, they sort of, they inculcate and insulate themselves. But um, it's, it's in, in the Netherlands, they're building whatever they've got. The ones we have, we have records of, they're talking about how these all have to be straight and trimmed to specific sizes. You don't have that in the Netherlands, they're building with basically whatever they can find. Um, but it's a massive structure when you think about it. This is a, I couldn't get my tape all the way down this. I believe this is 120 feet long by 40 feet wide. And you think about it as a, as a, as a structure, that's massive. Um, with these <laughs> massive overhangs oh my God. To, protect, to protect, basically these are to protect the waddle and dog is flying in place. Now, what do we have that survives? Well, this is the style. Everyone likes to talk about anchor beams when they're talking about Dutch architecture. There it is. There's your anchor beam. That's the only thing that can be called an anchor beam because it's got a protruding tenon which is wedged. Now, again, you can see they're clearly building with whatever they have. Uh, if you walked into a barn today in the United States and you saw a timber that, that was that curved, you'd probably think the builders had done something wrong. We don't need, I mean, this one back here is S-curved. It literally is curved in two directions. It goes down and then up again and then back down. Um, we don't need to build with curved timbers. We have a vast majority, of vast supply of trees. We get to do things like that. Those are 12 inches by 24 inches long. 24 inches wide. So it's one foot by two foot by 24 feet long. Two of these are made out of the same tree. Um, we know, we have records that in the 17th and 18th century, white pine which was the common building material for these barns, was in stands 200 to 300 feet tall. Consider the redwoods of California, now imagine eastern white pine. The forests were completely different than they are today because earthworms were imported from Europe from Jamestown and New Amsterdam. There was no worm in, the United States, in, in North America that could turn over leaf litter. So the forests, prior to the arrival of the European continent, had two to three feet of duff underneath them. So you find these Europeans talking about these vast cathedrals of forests. It's because 
Nothing can grow in the understory because you've got 200 years of leaves compressing it. It's when the, it's when the earthworms arrive and start turning the, the leaves over, turning the soil over, that's when understory can start to happen. Um, so you've got these massive trees. Uh, the Dutch are doing things with me. You don't find anchor beams this big in the Netherlands. They don't have trees this big in the Netherlands. They've never had trees this big in the Netherlands. Um, and so here in the New World, these become points of pride. If you look at the beams in a Dutch barn, it's nearly impossible to see any axe marks because a Dutch carpenter didn't want you to see the axe marks. Um, there's a tool called a, a stick file or a stick axe, which basically is a giant sort of chisel looking thing, it's a scrub plane. Um, I believe it was used to, to clean all the timbers off. Uh, I'm still working on that theory. But this is, I mean, this is the standard Dutch barn. So go back, sort of, you've got a central aisle, and then two side aisles. And then above these, you typically would lay down poles. You call them mouth poles, big sticks. Store your hay on top of it. The doors on wooden hinges could be opened from either end. They've got these big roofs, little pentas roofs that hang out. This is where you do your threshing. You get a cross ventilation. The Dutch were very good at cross ventilation. Most Dutch houses who go into the Dutch doors split so you can get breeze in the summertime, typically on either side of the house, without having to worry about the kids getting out. So this is, this is the, the frame for that pentas roof, and you can see those big wooden hinges. They're set right into the beams. And then these, and that's, that's all that's supporting that big roof that sticks out front. So this is, uh, this is the mill at Phillipsburg Manor. Um, this is the farmhouse as it looked in 1750. They took, it was expanded on and added to and added to, and, and I mean, it had a beautiful sort of 1780s kitchen wing and some Victorian things on it. And, uh, and when the historic Hudson Valley got a hold of it, um, as many museums in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s were wont to do, they stripped everything off uh, post a certain date. And the date they chose was 1750 when Adolf Phillips dies uh, and leaves 52 pages of inventory. Dies without a will. Richest man in New York State. Um, so, if you want to see what this house looked like in 1750, there it is. Um, this barn was actually moved from the Upper Hudson Valley. In the early 80s, the barn that was there burned to the ground. So they moved this barn there. <laughs> Um, these are interior shots from that barn. So again, there's that, there's that, and there are those mouth holes I was talking about. Uh, this is a fairly truncated anchor beam. So if you go into a barn and you see, and you see these little guys sticking out, you're in a Dutch barn. Um, um, you sort of see down here, you've got, uh, you've got some caging there. This is actually an animal pen below. Uh, when it was still an operating farm, mm -hmm. Five ten years ago, that's where they kept the cows. It's no longer a working farm. Um, so, and then here you can see the connection. Now, the amazing thing about Dutch framing is 75% of the roof load is carried on that timber. Um, the the plates here at the end walls carry almost no load. I've seen I've seen Dutch barns where this entire wall has rotted out and the rafters are still straight because most of the load is carried on these which transfer all the way down and you've got these big anchor beams that keep them in tension. It's sort of the, the it's sort of one of the wonders of Dutch timber framing. And then you can see here there's that roof. And then there's a little mortise here. You can put a you can, there are removable staves to lock your doors. Um, these are amazingly functional utilitarian buildings. Herricks dotted the Hudson Valley. Um, I've actually seen pictures of these, strangely enough, in Nantucket in 1900 on the Dutch model. 
The whole roof raises and lowers. Um, there's typically pulleys, and the whole thing goes up and down as you, as you use your hay or bring your hay in. And you can see there's a bigger one over here. Um, hay rigs still in the Netherlands are, they're monstrous. You can find them where they're 50 by 50. And, and, and generally just on four or five poles. And there, so this is the famous Van Bergen overmantle, which was taken out of the house in Leeds. Um, and there, you know, there's that famous, there's that typical Dutch house. First house, second house, upper chamber, stoop. There's that Dutch barn. Two hayricks. Strangely enough, this one is raised. So, perhaps barley. We, some, other, some other crop you want to get up off the ground, not just A but some kind of rain crop uh, that you perhaps didn't want your rats getting into. <laughs> um, this is a syrup house. I, I kind of find it fascinating because you've got these anchor beams sticking through the walls. You don't get that in the United States. Um, again, I think you did in the 17th century, but that much end grain sticking out in the Northeast climate means rot. And, and so these little, these little things that they're using festively to hang lights off of um, don't exist in the United States. Uh, there are a couple of houses where they do exist, but they're, they're covered by side aisle. They're, 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 they're residences where they've got side aisles on them, and the anchor beams survive. So, industrial. The Dutch are known for one thing, The Netherlands is one of the windiest places I've ever been to. Um, and that's a 17th century mill still in service. That's a polar mill in the city of Delft. It is used to pump water. So this is, this is, at, the, this is at the museum. This too was a polar mill. Obviously it's been moved, it's no longer in service. But polder mills can come in all sorts of forms and sizes. That's a polder mill. That's for draining water out of your field and moving it somewhere else. I mean, it's, it's, you can, one person can move that. Um, that's a polder mill. It's literally an Archimedes screw on a fan. Think about it, the Netherlands, completely, for a great portion, under sea level. You gotta get the water up, so there are a series of dikes raising the water level continuously further until you get to the final outwash dike, which then drains into the river and the sea. So, polder mills uh, are sort of all the thing. You find them all over the Netherlands still. This lovely mill, um, all right, anybody take a guess as to what this mill does? It's an industrial mill. A grain mill? Close. It's a sawmill. It's a sawmill and the cap turns, which is sort of unusual for it to be a square frame because usually cap mills are, uh, are on round frames. Now, you've got two main, really two main types of, of mills in the Netherlands. You've got cap mills and post mills. Caps, the, the head turns. Post mills, the whole body of the windmill turns. Um, like that little green holder mill that I showed you. Or this guy. That entire mill was turned by the miller at the bottom of this staircase to turn it into the wind. There are drawings of New Netherland, of New Amsterdam, that show the bottom portion of Manhattan covered in these. We know that windmills were being put up across Long Island, New Jersey, New Netherland. It is my presumption that as the industrial age kicks in, wind is no longer, and coal is plentiful, Wood is plentiful. These are uh, these are difficult to maintain. They require a certain level of carpenter, 
And as the city grows up around it, you lose your wind. The only places where these mills survive are the east end, eastern end of Long Island, mm -hmm. the Hamptons. If you drive through Watermill, this is the cat mill and Watermill, um, because there's a constant supply of wind. Western Long Island, the Hudson Valley, they start switching over to water power, barrier. Um, like this mill, 1714, in Roslyn, New York. It's, it is a Dutch framed brisk mill. It is probably the oldest extant Dutch industrial building in North America. Um, it's, it's currently in a great state of disarray. Uh, it's, it's got concrete siding and it's 15 feet below street level. Hmm. Um, so this is the, this, I think these has photos were taken in the 60s. Um, there's a restoration re effort underway. If you get a chance to go down and see the Robeson Mill, it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, the grist mill at Phillipsburg Manor would have been the same style. Um, but we do know that, so Adolf Phillips has two grist mills. They're uh, provisioning mills. Phillips, the Phillips Manor is a provisioning plantation, 54,000 acres. It's the entirety of Little Westchester County. One man owns it. It is there to supply his holdings in Barbados with dairy and grain because it is cheaper to have tenant farmers in New York produce those things and ship them to the Caribbean than to take even an acre out of sugarcane production in the Caribbean. Wow. So 54,000 acres of New York land was being used to keep Adolf Phillips' enslaved Africans fed in Barbados as they were making sugarcane. Wow. That should say something about the economy of 17th and 18th century wow. in the Netherlands and New York. Wow. Uh, we know at the, at the lower mills there were six millstones, and at the upper mill there were four millstones. They operated six days a week, 340 days a year. Think about how much grain that's producing, how much flour. Um, I throw this in as a, as a sort of curiosity. It's a wheelwright's building. But strangely enough, the, base, the, the, the spacing between what we call vents, so the, the Dutch frame is that, is that H2 post and a cross beam, that's a vent, typically every four feet. These are spaced about mm, eight feet apart. This building's about 16 feet long. Mm. That's English style. This building is built about 1725 in the Netherlands. So has English tradition come across? Is it because it's a wheelwright shop that they can sort of get away with not keeping everything, not using so much timber? Um, I don't know, it's an interesting, this is an interesting building, sort of, that's why I throw it in, it's, it's a combination. One ledge. Um, interesting that the timber frame is exposed. I only know of one Dutch building in North America where the timber frame is exposed. Um, and you wouldn't even know that if you saw it from the streets, the Beatty Kramer House. Strangely enough, outside of Frederick, Maryland, when Denver dated to 1748, the family moved down to Frederick, um, from Ulster County. Uh, they were an English family, but I presume they built a, they brought a Dutch carpenter with them because that house is as Dutch as possible. Um, I've been down, I've been brought down a couple times to go over that building. Um, we're still in the process of, of teasing the whole thing apart, but it appears to be a high style 18th, 17th, 18th century Dutch house in the middle of Frederick County, and it's got exposed timber frame with brick nogging. Um, and even the little dairy building that was built in the 1780s is Dutch frame. So it's a whole sort of mystery unfolding. So I've talked about Rensselaer Bike and how you've got this colony, this, this inculcated area of Dutch speaking people. People in the Dutch tradition, Dutch carpenters. So American Revolution happens, 
The city of Hudson is founded in 1783 by a series of uh, businessmen, whalers from New Bedford, Nantucket, Providence. Uh, they send two of their agents up the Hudson River with $100,000 in, 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 in gold. And what they want to do is find a port. They want to find deep water harbor. And they find Hudson which at that point was called Clawbrick Landing. It was a little promontory. There were 123 people living there, and there were bays on either side, North Bay, South Bay. And due to the strange geologic nature of the Hudson River, which technically is a fjord, uh, it is one of America's, North America's only fjords, and it is tidal all the way to the Falls of Cahos. So the water is brackish all the way to Albany. That is a deep water port 90 miles from the mouth of the river. Perfect for whaling because businessmen during the American War for Independence had lost something on the order of 470 whaling ships were either sunk or captured by the British Navy. So they didn't want, you know, it's, it's only 1783. The war is really, I mean, the British are still in New York City. Uh, so they find this deep water port and they create the city of Hudson. And all of a sudden, you have all of these English settlers moving in. And strange things start to happen. Now, that's the Shaker Meeting House at Hancock. Which originally, it was at Harvard. I'm sure, at Harvard, at Harvard, Harvard Mass. There are 12 of these built in the space of five years by one master builder. That is the one at Canterbury Shaker Village in New Hampshire. It is identical to the other 12 that were built. There are only four left. The one at Hancock, Canterbury, Sabbath Day Lake, which is still an active Shaker community. And the fourth one, you'd never know it if you went there, is, um, oh god, and the name just went leaping out of my brain. Um, the St. Gaudens Historic Site in New Hampshire. Augustus St. Gaudens' brother buys a Shaker meeting house and turns it into a studio. So if you go to that historic site and you go to Augustus St. John's brother's studio, it's actually a Moses Johnson meeting house. Moses Johnson is from eastern New York. He's from Rensselaervik. This is a Dutch framed building being used by English religious separatists. Um, there's some evidence that shows that uh, Asher Benjamin, who was one of the first true American architects, probably was, had worked alongside Moses Johnson. Um, Moses Johnson, besides for building 12 of these in the space of five years, um, builds a massive number of other complex, other complex buildings for the Shakers, which shows he was more than just a, a builder. Um, he builds a couple mills for them. So we see that, the, the, that other people are picking up the Dutch traditions. And it's, you, you, it's, it's as Dutch as it gets. Although this is an odd picture because when it was moved from Harvard Mass to Hancock Shaker Village, you see that? See that mark right there in the frame? And then see that steel plate? They cut the frame in half. Rather than disassemble it frame by frame, they literally came through with a chainsaw <laughs> and lifted everything from the tie beam off and moved the bottom as one piece and the top as one piece. We've come a long way in the preservation field. <laughs> um, yeah, if you want the, the Habs, all the Habs pictures for this building are online. If you if you've ever want to sort of wander around the Historic American Building Survey, the pictures that are online are fantastic and fascinating because you know about a third of the buildings that are photographed are gone. Um, it's why the, which why the Historic American Building Survey was created in the, during the Depression was to record buildings that were disappearing. So. <clears throat> You might call this an eyebrow colonial. Um, lots of people live in these. Some people call them federal story and a half. Um, the truth of the matter is, framing-wise, this is an Anglo-Dutch hybrid. This is something that is created in the Hudson Valley and around about the border of Nassau and Suffolk on an island. Uh, anywhere where you've got Dutch carpenters and English carpenters sort of rubbing together. Um, 
these get created. And the, and the difference is, is the way it's all laid out. But I mean, there's that, there's that new wall. Um, the, the English don't use new walls. They have either, you know, either the, the roof is right there on that first floor plate, or if it's a second floor, it's a full second floor. And well, clearly, that's not Dutch framed because if you had a post every four feet, you can't have that many windows. There's just not that much room between between the Benz and the Dutch frame. Uh, and they're everywhere. Um, you start looking, I've recorded mm, 115 in Columbia County alone, in northern Columbia County alone. Uh, strangely enough, this was the topic of my master's thesis. Uh, so this is something I've, I've sort of, it's end run in me. And I did an end run on me and got me into, into these weird little houses. And they're fascinating. Um, they're all, and they, they come from various sizes, you know, this sort of the three bay where it's two windows and a door, fairly small. Um, you get them where they're much bigger. They take Greek revival ornament like nobody's business. Um, pilasters, big freeze boards. Um, the 1830s are very, very kind to this style of house. So, and so we know the Dutch carpenters, primarily in Rensselaer bike have to build something on the order of 270 houses a year from 1790 to 1800. That's the population expansion in Columbia County. That's a lot of houses. They don't have that many carpenters. So they start coming up with these fast and dirty ways to build these houses. Um, and you know, sort of even built on the hillside, it's three story, but there's that, there's that knee wall. Um, I know this building intimately, it's my house. <laughs> um, and so, there's your typical Dutch frame. Every four feet, there's a tie beam. All right, there's, there's no room for windows on, this, on, that, on that second floor. There's that English frame. You might have windows at the gables, um, but the, the second story is fairly unusable. I mean, you, you've got some space here in the middle. Uh, but if you've ever been up in the attic of a cape, there's not a lot going on in there. It's fairly tight quarters. And you get these guys, where it's a tie beam every 12 feet. And then they use these sort of big heavy joists every two to four feet in Dutch fashion. But lots of places for windows. You don't have to have posts every four feet. This is, a, this is a combination of English and Dutch timber frame. And this style starts in the Hudson Valley and goes as far west, I found it as far west as Wisconsin, hmm. and as far east as Maine. This really becomes one of the first truly American house styles. It's, it's versatile, it's quick to build, um, it doesn't require a lot of complex joinery. If you think about a Dutch frame, for each one of these, you'd have to cut mortise, tenon, braces. This has got one, two, three, four, five, six mortises in the tie beam level, six mortises in the plate level. That's 12 mortises. With a trained crew, you can cut this house in a week. And if you think about how many houses are going up in the years after the revolution, you know, really what I means it's, it's, it's two piles deep, you've got a back room. Um, you can add another floor if you want. This, this style becomes one of the most prevalent house styles in the colonies when then in the United States for about 30, 40 years. Um, until 1830s when balloon framing and sawmills mm -hmm. and trains and canals allow people to start moving material around. If you've got a timber framer, Who's hewing their timbers out of raw stock? This is the quickest, cheapest, easiest house. And you can throw as much decoration on it as you want. You can make this as high style or as low style as possible. Um, so this, and there is some, there is an argument to be made. I haven't quite gotten around to it yet. Uh, it's, it's one of the things we discussed within some of the circles I've traveled, that balloon framing, which exists from 1830 to 1930, um, which is what all Victorian houses are, which is basically a, uh, a stud every 16 to 18 inches. 
two stories tall, is in fact the sawn descendant of that style of frame. That balloon framing is the quick and dirty way to do a Dutch frame without having to do the, the tie beams, without having to do the timber frame. So there is an argument to be made that the prevalent form of framing in the United States is a descendant of, of Netherlandish timber framing. So, and there's a lot of talk about uh, seasons changing, things being different. We know that water levels are rising. Boston is flooding on a regular basis. Uh, the governor of Boston, the governor of Massachusetts, just contracted with Dutch firms to talk about building dikes around Boston. Um, like I said, God created the earth, the Dutch made Holland. Um, the Dutch, for centuries, because they made their living on the water, have been using both water and wind power to power the world. I firmly believe that moving into this, the rest half of this century, the Dutch will take the forefront in, in both uh, sort of environmental control vis-a-vis -vis oceans. If anyone's been to Holland, you know that the windmills are still there. They just dot the horizon. If you fly into Amsterdam, it's the, the Nord Zee, North Sea wind fields, hundreds of wind farms. The entirety of the Dutch public transit system, the Dutch train system, is powered by wind power. And if you've been to Holland, you know that you can basically go anywhere in the country by train. Um, now admittedly, when your country is the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island, you can get away with these things. Uh, but, so this is the view from the tower of the old church in Delft. This is out of Delft. These are the canals. Out there is the Hague and Haag. And one of the things that fascinates me about the Dutch is the combination of traditional and modern. And I think they have a lot to teach us still. We become obsessed with the modern. We abandon the traditional. It's why, for the last 30 years, we've been recreating what 100 years ago was absolutely a common trade, which is timber framing. Uh, I, my apprentice is 55? <laughs> <laughs> Finding someone under the age of 30 to work for me is difficult. Um, we eschew the traditional in the United States. I think that's starting to turn around. Better. But, I believe, following the Dutch model, if we allow you know, this traditional 18th century gable building, which you can see now has this sort of strange glass back and all those solar panels, you look, I mean, half of these buildings have solar panels. It is a combination of traditional and modern, which I think leads the way. And if we can take a moment and think about the future, both ourselves and our children, I think the Dutch can help us get there. Good. Yeah, there are those windows. Thank you. <laughs>